the other day, I had a conversation with a friend of my mother. She wanted to know why it takes so long to charge her electric car. Why can't they charge faster, she said. And then I proceeded to explain the differences between AC EV chargers and DC chargers. And at some point, her eyes glazed over and I was pretty sure she wasn't listening anymore. Yes, it sure would be nice if our EV chargers worked faster. But one key to the future of electric charging is in the onboard chargers themselves. And that was definitely not a story that I was going to share that day. But how about we talk about it now? <laughs> Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Onboard charging modules are a key component for a variety of electric cars today. And the device selection and topology for these chargers depends on target efficiency, cost, and power density. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Kevin Keller from OnSemi and I explored the design considerations for onboard chargers, the power requirements needed for these kinds of designs, and the role that packaging plays in the development of onboard charging solutions. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from OnSemi. Hi, Kevin. Thank you so much for joining me. Good to be here. Excellent. Okay, so we're talking about how onboard chargers can enable vehicle electrification. But, Kevin, before we dig into the details, what all will we be covering today? So we're going to take a quick look at the OBC system requirements in general, EV charging considerations, quick look at the block diagram, which is really nothing more than a big AC to DC converter, and then a little bit more detailed look at the PFC and especially a more detailed look at the OBC section over the down converter, the secondary side. That one's a little bit unique for the vehicle, so that deserves a little bit of special attention. And then we want to take a quick look at packaging considerations just because space is becoming more and more of an issue. Even in this particular application, space-constrained environments require special packaging considerations. Excellent. Now, Kevin, can you explain the difference in when an onboard charger would be used and when it would not be? So for electrification, the simplest way is mild hybrid. That's nothing more than having a booster in the vehicle. And then you go into a full hybrid. So the full hybrid has an engine and a battery management system, a much bigger battery in that case. But there is no outside connection, right? Uh, there is no need to charge the battery. It's not until you move to a pluggable configuration or you go to a full electric vehicle. At that point, the battery is big enough that an external charger is required. And so on either of those two applications, there will be an OBC. That makes sense. Now, what kind of design considerations should we keep in mind when it comes to onboard chargers? So uh, this is very similar to any other electronic application. Power density is always at a premium, and that's just the footprint of the overall module. Efficiency is also an issue. Now, this is a little bit different in terms of if you have a traction drive, which is not particularly efficient, that's going to reduce the battery capacity effectively. That's going to limit the range of the vehicle. That wouldn't necessarily happen here, but it doesn't matter because the OEMs still have requirements for efficiency. And that is going to vary from OEM to OEM. So typically 95% is the basement. We see higher being requested. We also have to look at the mains. So obviously in the United States, single or split phase mains would be common. Europe is almost always going to be three phase mains. The battery voltage that we're dealing with, 400 is very common today. We're moving to 800. And then whether or not it's unidirectional or bidirectional, and we do see a growing trend towards bidirectional devices that does allow the vehicle to participate not only in the grid, but also in the home energy ecosystem. Any conversion that's going to the grid, isolation is going to be a concern, EMC is going to be a concern, and anything automotive is always going to have cost as a concern. That's never going to go away. We're also seeing instances in which this has to be incorporated with other functionality. Not uncommon to put an auxiliary DC-DC in there, and that's to run things like the electrical power steering unit, the AC compressor, 
it is important to note also that this thing will connect a battery to grid, a very big battery. And so it has been rated as an ASIL D application. It is of the most critical applications within a vehicle. So the EV charging landscape has evolved in recent years. So can you give us a glimpse of what it looks like now? So actually, uh, the slide before you now, I put together, ironically enough, after visiting some of my customers. So there was discussion during some of those meetings of, you know, I wonder how long this thing's actually going to be around, right? So you buy a cell phone and you don't get a charger anymore because the assumption is your personal charging landscape will cover it. This is definitely not that situation. So if we look at the charging landscape for an EV, most of that's going to be at home, and that could be a level one or a level two charger. Some of that is going to be at the workplace. That is most commonly actually going to be a level two charger. Both of those are AC output. They do need the OBC. And then in lesser number of cases, and you see just the number of installations out there, what commonly is called level three, and that's actually a kind of an old nomenclature, that is a DC direct charger. There are an increasing number of those, but by no means is there enough to charge all of the vehicles and handle all of the charging cases for an electric vehicle. So the, the bottom line is this is an application that is not going to go away for a very long time. So, Kevin, what about the United States in particular? What kind of use cases are you seeing here? So according to the U.S. Department of Energy, about 80% of charging for an electric vehicle in the United States is done at the home. That can be done either level one or level two. You are seeing an uptick in the number of level two installations in houses. And that's just because if you were doing level one, you might only be charging at a rate of five miles per hour, which is going to take quite a long time to fully bring the battery back up to charge. If you look at the workplace environment, you actually see a situation where most of those are also level two chargers. It's much cheaper to install a level two pole. It's a much simpler device in a workplace. And so it is easier for a manufacturer or a company to justify doing that. Installing a DC charger is a bigger deal. The grid locally has to be able to support that is almost always going to be a 480 volt application. And so you don't see as many of those. So definitely in the United States and actually in many other parts of the world, most of this charging is going to be done through that OBC for sure. So what kind of power requirements are we talking about when it comes to these different onboard chargers? So that's been changing. So we actually had a situation when vehicles first started coming out, they had relatively smaller batteries in them. A 6.6 kilowatt, 7.4 kilowatt charger would not have been uncommon. Battery capacity is going up significantly. And that's because of range anxiety. People want more range out of their vehicles. And so if we look at the U.S. landscape, common in Japan also, that's typically single phase or split phase. And now you're seeing most of that going up to about 11 kilowatts. That's very common. Most of the higher-end vehicles, most of the mid-end vehicles are going to be equipped with an 11 kilowatt OBC. In Europe, the situation is a little bit different just from the mains. They do support three-phase mains, very, very common over in Europe. And so we see the kilowatt capability of the charger going up to 22, and that is also an advantage. You can charge it faster without going to a direct DC charger. So, Kevin, are there any overarching considerations for onboard charger design that we should keep in mind? So, one thing to keep in mind, really, is that this is a very different application from the traction portion of the vehicle. The traction portion of the vehicle is a full bridge. It is going to run almost always in the range of 10 to 20 kilohertz. This is going to run faster. So there are two stages in this design. One stage is the PFC, the other is the down converter. The PFC stage we see typically running 65 to 100 kilohertz. Some people wanting to go faster, and that is a hard switch stage. On the secondary side, almost all topologies are actually soft switch. They're zero voltage switching. And we see most customers wanting to run at least 200 kilohertz and actually faster in many cases. So obviously you're connecting to a battery with a very wide voltage range. When the vehicle is fully discharged, you're looking at something like 250 volts and you're going to have to go all the way up to, say, 420 volts on a 400 volt battery pack. So this charger actually has to swing over a very wide voltage range and very high frequencies are used. 
one thing that it really has as an advantage is I really have not seen an instance where the charger did not have access to the vehicle's liquid cooling system. And in fact, if you walk by a vehicle that is charging at a pole, you'll oftentimes hear that system running. That's a big advantage for the OBC. And while the traction inverter does have a very high voltage associated with it, it does not interface with the grid. This situation, you're interfacing with the grid, special safety considerations apply, great caution has to be taken to ensure that a situation cannot take place where the AC mains are directly connected to the high voltage battery. That would be quite disastrous. Another thing to consider as well is we talk about phases in terms of power grid. So in the United States, a single phase main is common. In Europe, three phase mains are common, but there's a different sense of that word being used here. So when we talk about phases within the converter itself, it is possible to interleave multiple phases within the design. An 11 kilowatt OBC could be made in three phases that are interleaved, and there's some real advantages to that. Ripple currents and ripple voltages are reduced significantly, and you have a significant amount of design flexibility. You want an 11 kilowatt charger, three phases. If you want less power, two phases. Minimal redesign in downpowering that OBC. So, Kevin, what does a typical onboard charger look like? Basically, this is just a fairly high power AC to DC converter. So it's going to start out with a power factor correction unit, and that is going to help reduce the impact of the charger on the grid. In other words, it won't inject imaginary power or reactive power into the grid. And then you're going to go to an isolated DC-DC converter. And the isolation here is very important, obviously. We cannot have a situation where the battery is connected directly to the AC mains. So this system has to have some special safety features associated with it. Incidentally, it's one of those just being disabling the vehicle while the thing is connected. So in the early days of gasoline vehicles, nobody actually thought about somebody pulling away from the pump with the pump still connected. Well, they thought about that in electric vehicles. So that was a safety consideration that's been well considered. So, Kevin, can we look more in depth at a PFC? Yeah, so multiple topologies exist for this. The electric vehicles first started out, they were not particularly high power chargers. The batteries were not particularly big. And traditional PFC designs were typically being used, which is on this particular slide up in the upper right hand corner, you see a very traditional boost PFC four diodes, a switch, a diode used to prevent backflow into the converter in the mains. Very basic system, but actually a very good system, I and mean, it does its job very well. The problem is those diodes. Those diodes have a certain amount of power loss associated with them, and there's just nothing you can do about that. There aren't any options of very low VF diodes at these kinds of very high voltages. And so while this topology, whether it's an interleaved phase or a single phase, is commonly used in low power designs, as we go to high power designs, this is not the choice. So for higher power applications, however, and for instances where efficiency is more important or more desired by the OEM, now we have to go into a more complex configuration. In this particular case, we're showing a totem pole configuration. It's actually fairly common. It is very widely used in this particular application, whether or not it is done in a single phase. And again, this is the same as previously. We can go into multiple phases interleaved. There are significant advantages to doing that. In this particular case, we do have a couple of different application switches. In other words, we have the green ones. Green ones are the high speed switches. And then we have the blue ones in this image. Those are the low speed switches. So in this particular case, it is an option to have two different technologies serving the configuration that's shown. Okay, so Kevin, what kind of challenges are we talking about when it comes to totem pole PFC designs? So as we see here, we have the two high-speed switches and we have the two low-speed switches. For those high-speed switches, these are hard-switched applications. So this thing is going to be conducting when the switching transition occurs. And so that reverse recovery charge in the body diode of the device is actually quite a big deal. And so in this case, you would not want to use something like an IGBT or a superjunction device for those fast legs. That could get into quite a bit of loss and a significant drop in efficiency. However, if we go with silicon carbide, that body diode has very, very good performance. Its reverse recovery charge is very low. 
And not only that, but that reverse recovery charge is extremely stable over temperature. That is a very desirable attribute in this application. Yes, it has access to the vehicle's liquid cooling system. At the same time, it still needs to have minimal losses in order to meet efficiency requirements. This thing can get up to 99% efficient. So a big advantage for the totem pole configuration. And the totem pole is also versatile as well for three phase. So totem pole configuration can be used for a three phase. If it is a unidirectional, the totem pole isn't necessary. So one of the great things about the totem pole configuration is that it is bi-directional in nature. And so if you want to interact with the grid or the home's energy ecosystem, it is an excellent design option to use. The Vienna rectifier is used frequently for unidirectional designs. We do also support that even in modules. And so we have multiple options that can be used in the higher efficiency, higher power node. So what about the DC-DC solutions you mentioned earlier? Can we talk a bit about those as well? So in this particular case, again, it is an isolated step-down converter. So it's going to take power off that PFC. It's going to step it down to the appropriate battery voltage. And keep in mind that battery voltage is swinging over a considerably wide range. As the battery charges and discharges, its output voltage is changing dramatically. Traditionally, in a unidirectional, you would go through the primary stage, that would be MOSFET switches, and then simple rectifiers on the output stage. This is a situation where the rectifiers are fine. They do the job very well, as long as it's unidirectional. However, you get into efficiency concerns. Is it sufficient efficiency that you're going to get out of those rectifiers? The other option is to go with synchronous switches on that down converter. We see that happening more and more. We don't do a whole lot of work with the diodes anymore, just because, in all honesty, we don't see the demand. Even people who are doing unidirectional designs almost always are going with MOSFETs on that output stage. And that's just to get the efficiency that the OEMs are increasingly demanding for this application. So... What kind of solutions does OnSemi offer in terms of onboard charging solutions? So most of this conversation, we've been talking about the primary switches. One thing to note here is that OnSemi actually offers about 90% of the overall bomb associated with this application. So while we're focused on the high power switches, we want to keep in mind as well that we support the gate drive circuitry, we support the current sense circuitry, we support all of the low power components that go around it. There are housekeeping power supplies here as well. But for the power switches, we basically support it all. So it is not uncommon for superjunction MOSFETs to be used on that down converter stage. They do a very good job there. As we go towards the 800 volt battery pack node, the superjunction starts to lose a little bit of its steam. So at that point, oftentimes, it's almost always replaced by silicon carbide. We do support IGBTs. They're not used as commonly as they used to be, but really the area of focus is the silicon carbide. Silicon carbide MOSFETs really have some significant advantages. On that totem pole PFC stage, which is used quite commonly, they have very, very little reverse recovery charge, very stable. Even on the down converter stage, these guys wanna run oftentimes very high frequency. It is ZVS, it is also a quasi-resonant converter, but at the same time, it has to switch over a very wide voltage range. And so it's not always going to be able to stay at its resonant frequency. When it starts departing from that, silicon carbide is going to give you a really big advantage. So it just really simplifies the design problem when we go to silicon carbide. And we do offer a full complement of both discrete and module-based solutions to accommodate this application. So we also need to consider the packages of these onboard charging solutions as well, right? We do. So one of the things that we're seeing very common in the industry now and accelerating quite a bit is interest in top cool. And it really doesn't matter if that is from a module point of view or a discrete point of view. One of the things our customers are telling us is they simply can no longer drive the power from the switching devices into the main circuit board. The thermal budget of that board is already maxed out and it just doesn't work for them. So they want to pull the heat generated by these switches directly off of them and right into that heat sink. And again, that heat sink's got access to the car's liquid cooling system. So it's a very good thing to go with top cool. So we're doing this in terms of both discrete and module solutions. 
One thing that has to be kept in mind for the discrete devices is that they do have an electrically hot top surface. So that surface on the left-hand side that's metallic, that is electrically active. It does need to be isolated from the heat sink. And there are multiple ways of doing that, either just using thermal interface material or a ceramic, including thermal interface material. The modules have a bit of an advantage here. So the modules, that is a DVC. So it is a direct bond copper. It's a ceramic with metallic coating on the surface of it. That is fully electrically isolated. That can be directly connected to the heat sink. And it can do that with either a very thin layer of tin, or if very high thermal performance is needed, it could be silver centered to the heat sink and get just outstanding thermal performance. So while it is very common now to build these out of discrete components, the truth of the matter is we're seeing more and more interested in modules. And that is because it is possible to shrink the overall footprint of this application if one uses a module-based approach. Another aspect of the packaging is Calvin Sense. It is really not possible to get the advantages of silicon carbide without having a package that incorporates Calvin Sense. We have to remove the sense path from the main current path in order to realize the speed potential of these devices. So we are no longer producing our newest generations of silicon carbide in packages that will not support Calvin Sense. And that's just simply because designers need that functionality in order to get the full benefit out of this product line. And if we look here at the graph showing the performance difference, you can see the advantage. So we've taken the exact same device, we've put it in a package very similar. So we've got a three lead TO247, a four lead TO247, thermally pretty much the same thing. And you can see the difference in performance you get by having that fourth pin. The ability to use Calvin Sense really allows these devices to be used to their full benefit. Fantastic. Well, Kevin, before we go, can you recap your main points for me? Sure. So the onboard charger, we don't expect that application to go away anytime soon. The bulk of the charging for an electric vehicle for years and years to come is going to be done through this. It is, however, like any other application we see in all of our power supply designs, there is a drive towards additional efficiency improvements. Of course, cost is always going to be an element and power density is always key. It doesn't matter what the application is. We see a drive towards greater and greater power density. We see multiple solutions being used. There are more being developed all the time, but without the newest generation of electronic components and the best configurations, in other words, things like the totem pole PFC, it is not possible to get the overall application up to the efficiency standards many OEMs are demanding now. That's often better than 96% efficiency. That's for the entire converter, not just one stage. The solution, just like anything else in automotive, has to be cost effective. So that's really going to play into what the design is being asked to do. It's a low power application. IGBTs could be the most effective solution. Generally speaking, in the higher power applications, that's not going to be the case. That's where we see silicon carbide being used. And in fact, almost always on that PFC stage because it's hard switching, silicon carbide is the technology of choice. We support all of these. So whether or not the down converter uses super junction or silicon carbide, we have switches for all parts of this application. Excellent. Well, Kevin, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Goodbye. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from OnSemi. For Jock Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Jock Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash 